chapter number 13, continuing on in this series uh, of Light It Up. And as you can see, every week we got a new edition of lights, amen, uh, that, that is continuing to hopefully give you and I a frame of reference to appreciate how and why we should light it up. Now, uh, hopefully this isn't just, a, you know, a, a, a sense of uh, titillation for of your senses, but you are catching the kind of passive but even uh, explicit uh, admonition that every week we should be adding to our light. Amen. We should be trying to figure out what can I do every week to make sure that I'm bringing a little bit more light to the place where God has strategically placed me. And how many of you know you are indeed strategically placed by God wherever you are? Amen. Amen. Uh, you are not just a, 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 a result of, of, of fate and, and this, you know, kind of arbitrary uh, roll of the dice, like you playing, I don't know, is that roulette or blackjack or what's the one where you craps, I don't know, just hoping that you hit your seven or whatever the number is, that's a winning number. But you are actually, God put you right where you are because God wants you to shine some light on the situation that you're in. Uh, so hopefully every week we're compelling and being compelled to shine this light. How many of you took your candle somewhere last week, amen, and just placed it somewhere? All right, let me just get one or two people just to shout out, where did you put your candle, amen, as an expression of where you wanted the light to shine? At work, my God, today, amen. I heard a few works. How many people need some lights to shine at your job? Amen, amen. Anyone else? Something beside work? Oh, wow. oh my God. All right. It's no coincidence. Two of the places you spend most of your time every day, you still need the light of God. How many need the light to shine in your home? Amen. Amen. I had some visitors, some friends and guests that were here last week, and uh, we were celebrating the 40th birthday party. Another one of my friends, we grew up in together, and uh, we were at their house over in uh, San Francisco, and uh, she took her candle out and put it right there in the party. Amen. And I said, I hope this ain't going to, like, you know, mess up your party, praise God. Amen. Uh, but she said, no, I need this light to shine right here in my auntie's house where we have for this party. And I thank God for that. I was like, oh, that's pretty dope. It made me think maybe I need to figure out something to hand out to y'all every week. <laughs> uh, that gets a little expensive. So we'll just give you this free word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We're going to uh, uh, take a little bit of time uh, to read uh, this passage of scripture. Now, the book of Acts, again, is uh, what many regard to be uh, Luke part two. All right. It is uh, the continuation of Luke's uh, telling of the story of Jesus and the consequential uh, 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 maturation of the followers of Jesus from a, a ragtag band of, of outsiders to actually being led by the Spirit of God to create a vibrant community of followers of Jesus. And early on in the book of Acts, the first kind of way that church was described, they were called followers of the way, touch your name or somebody, amen, ain't that a good coincidence, amen, that they weren't called Christians, they were called followers of the way, and it was indeed uh, the way of Jesus that many of them were wrestling and struggling to actually live into. Uh, they were, at their core, Jews, Jewish people who had been waiting for the Messiah, but this writer, the writer of the book of Acts, who was the same person who wrote the book of Luke, uh, was trying to give a presentation of the gospel to those who were outside of the Jewish community. So Luke took what he heard and learned and read and experienced from eyewitness testimonies like Mark and Peter and a few other folks. He took some of the shared documents that, that were used to uh, collect the sayings of Jesus and Matthew. And he took all of these and he put together what he called the most excellent account of the gospel of Jesus and the acts of the early apostles. Thus we have the book of Acts. 
The book of Acts, the Acts of the early apostles, the disciples, those who helped develop and through the leading of the Holy Spirit established the church that we all are lineage from and to. We find as we pick up in this chapter this morning in uh, verse number, I believe we're going to go to verse number where are we going? 42. Amen. Because I got a different version up here and it's messing me up. So maybe I'll just use what's up on the screen. Uh, but as we look and see what is happening here, we see Paul the Barnabas, two of the early converts of the Christian faith. They heard the message of Jesus and they were uh, deeply uh, uh, convicted. Paul, if you know his story, he used to be Saul and he was one of these folks that was killing Christians because he was so zealous for the ways of his Ju Jude Jude Judaism and, and his cultural identity. He was just on fire for it so much that he was actually killing Christians. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. Damascus. Man, I'm learn to talk before this sermon is over. Uh, the, the road to Damascus and a bright light shined on Paul. And the scripture says it knocked him to the ground. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't want that kind of light. Amen. I, I'd rather have a light that I can bask in, not the light that knocks me to the ground. But some of us need a good knock into the ground every once in a while to get our attention. And this light shone on Paul. And Paul ended up getting up blind and had to be... Uh, moved and worked and, and, and nurtured into the faith. And along the journey, people were afraid of Paul, whose name used to be Saul, because everything they knew about Paul, who used to be Saul, was that he was an assassin. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's one thing, you know, to be, uh, you know, have a reputation uh, that precedes you. Amen. But now you're coming into a church where when you used to come to the church, like you were actually taking folk out. And now your story is, I saw a light from God, and now I'm actually here to be a part of this community. I bet you there were some folk who were looking at Saul or Paul and was like, mm, I don't know, you took my cousin and them and you like, you know, messed them up, you know. And some of them was like, I don't know if I want you to sit next to me. I'm a little nervous. Because what if you have a flashback or something where you backslide? And, you know, I want to be close to the door. I don't want to get caught up in your stuff. Amen. And ain't that something? Amen. Because that's how, you know, some of us, we can get a little funny about the people, you know, we want close to us because of their history. Their reputation precedes them. So God sends along a guy by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas, his name means encourager. He was very much led by the Spirit to make room for Paul to do what God called Paul to do. And they both found a place in the church called Antioch. And this is kind of where we're picking up the story, all right? So that was some background to give you a little bit of context for what we're going to read today. But, you know, if I would say one thing, and we'll probably preach on it later on this year, there is always a good pathway for spiritual development and formation, and you can use it uh, by just the Barnabas, Paul, and we'll add another figure in there. His name is Timothy. Barnabas, Paul, and Timothy. Barnabas was willing to mentor and disciple someone. Paul was willing to be mentored and discipled. And then Paul was willing to mentor and disciple someone else. So just a real quick freebie. Always make sure you have a Barnabas and a Timothy in your life. Somebody that can mentor you and someone you can be a mentor to. While you always stay open to being mentored. Amen. Uh, tell your neighbor, have a Paul and a Timothy in your life. Amen. And... Uh, if that was still too complex for you, we'll pick it up in a couple of months. Amen. Uh, so we're going to take this passage here. Acts chapter number 13, verse number 42. As Paul and Barnabas were going out. So they're in Antioch and they're still preaching in the synagogues and the temple. Uh, this message of Jesus, a controversial message, a message that usually got folk ostracized, killed, etc. But they were compelled. Going out, the people urged them to speak about these things again the next Sabbath. So, when the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them, and urged them to continue in the grace 
of God. Verse number 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. That's my goal next week, all right? I want all of Oakland, Berkeley, and Richmond to be here next week. So y'all work on that, all right? Verse number 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Somebody say haterism. Amen. Amen. And blasphemy. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. But since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. Ooh. Amen. Next verse. This is where the crux of our sermon will be today. For the Lord has commanded us saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Oh, that's a good one, right? I have set you to be a light to the Gentiles so that you may bring Salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord. And as many as had been destined for eternal life became believers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to spend a few moments speaking about how to light it up. All right. The how to light it up. Bow your hands with me as we pray. Father, bless the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. All right. How to light it up. Now, there's a couple things that uh, are worth uh, attempting to unpack here. Again, uh, we see Paul and Barnabas, two individuals who themselves were not a part of the original 12 of Jesus, but yet they have been welcomed and called into the ministry, the sharing, the proclaiming of this great gospel. And they have been set out, sent out into places to go. Why? Because what Jesus told them from the beginning, and even it was confirmed early in the book of Acts, is that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be the agents, the tools, the amplifiers of the good news of Jesus to the ends of the most parts of the earth. It actually says to Judea and Galilee, and it gives you all these, these kind of circles of boundaries of impact. And I think that's an important uh, consideration because often the vision of God, the commands of God, can often be so magnanimous that they paralyze us. So this idea that you should go to the ends of the earth. Amen. I know if you're like me uh, and you put the ends of the earth in your GPS, uh, not only will you not find the destination, but you get the sense that you're going to be driving forever. Sometimes the ends of the earth needs to be contextualized. That the light that you have, God will want you to help define what is the end you. What is the place and the space that God has strategically placed you where your light can shine so the glory of the gospel can reach the ends of your earth? Your circle of influence, your holies, your environment, those places where you are uniquely positioned to make an impact. And it's so important for you and I, as we're moving through 2016, to get real clear about where God would position us for our light to shine. Because if you're clear about where you are positioned, then you may pay closer attention to the many ways that God will surprise you based off of where you are. I don't know about you, but the more familiar I am of my 
surroundings, the more I am able to recognize things when they shift, when they, as they say in the matrix, when there's a glitch in the matrix, right? Where something shifts, like, wait, 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 no, something just happened right there. But if I'm just walking around, I'm not aware of anything, and I'm just letting it all just, I'm just sucking it all in, I'm just totally, you know, out the lunch half the time, I'm just like, you know, then, then when things happen, I can totally be oblivious and miss out on an opportunity to make an impact. You see, God has given you this light, the light of the gospel, so you can shine in general, but also so you, as the scripture says, you have been set in place to be a light to the Gentiles, to those who are excluded, to those who do not know who Jesus is, to those who have not yet been exposed to the truth of the gospel. Now, here living in America, everybody thinks they know who Jesus is. But it's so fascinating that for most folk, they think they know who Jesus is, except when Jesus shows up. I mean, we saw this phenomenon last week uh, when, when we were celebrating MLK's birthday. I don't know how many of you all captured some of uh, our folks here who were marching through the streets. And thank God for all y'all that did the actions and participated in the peacemaker training. I don't know if I didn't see if any of y'all shut down the Bay Bridge last week. I, I, I wanted to. I was in New York uh, doing an event uh, at the Riverside Church. So I was not able to shut down the Bay Bridge. If I was in town, I would have done it, though. Just to be clear, amen. I believe in that stuff, praise God. Uh, and, 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 and it was so funny, people were all upset about who was shutting down the Bay Bridge. They said, how dare you shut down the Bay Bridge on Martin Luther King Day? <laughs> Martin Luther King would just be rolling in his grave if he knew that you was shutting down the bridge. So the best response was just to put up pictures of Dr. King shutting down bridges, amen. It's like, He's so good. He's rolling in his grave that you've not participated. Amen. And he's still on the sideline. 13% of the churches in the civil rights time, only 13% supported the civil rights movement. Amen. So this ain't new. People think they're familiar with stuff until stuff happens and their own eyes are often blinded. So be careful that you think you know Jesus till Jesus starts showing up and then, you know, like, oh, that ain't Jesus, that ain't Jesus, that ain't Jesus. Like, well, maybe it is. And, you know, you just got to be open to a little bit of a divine surprise. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Because when the light shines, you don't get to control the light. The light just shines. And whatever has an absence of light will be filled and touched by the light. What then is the ends of the earth where you are being compelled to shine this light? Paul and Barnabas were very clear. We're in Antioch, and in Antioch there are some Jews here, but there's also some Gentiles. So we're going to preach this message to those who we think are ready to hear it, but we're also going to make sure that we're proclaiming this in places where those who may not necessarily be, you know, assumed them to be touched by it as well. Paul in Romans, he says the best, I have made it my ambition to preach the good news where it has not been heard before. So when you're in your ends of the earth, in your family, in your community, how can you let the light of this gospel in 2016 penetrate and shine? In places where you are not necessarily convinced it may take hold or root. Because how many of you know, depending on what part of your life stage you're in, you were not a sure thing either. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. I mean, it's hard, <laughs> it's really hard to imagine after you've received the good news, to imagine how much of a risky proposition it was for God to shine on you. Because some of us, we weren't absorbing the light, we were 
refracting, reflecting, like that, like bing, you know, just bouncing off of you. But there was a part in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, where that light penetrated and it took root and it took home. Anybody glad about that today? I'm glad that this light shined on me. So, how is it that you can indeed let the light of this gospel shine? Well, I'm going to give you a few ways. Uh, uh, the, the, the first way that I'm going to lift up and follow me back there in the sound room because I think I'm going to go a little bit out of order. Is the first way that I'm going to tell you, you must be willing to share your story. Everybody say, share my story. Share your story. Tell your neighbor, you got a story to tell. Share it. You got to share your story. Now, why is this important? Because for many of us, you and I must appreciate, as the scripture says, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your story is often the first introduction that people will have to the light of this gospel. <clears throat> Paul said it like this, or maybe it was Peter. Your life is a written epistle, a written letter of what God is doing in the world. Your life. And some of us are so shy about our story. We only like to tell the parts of the story where we know we'll get some applause on It took you eight years. <laughs> Hello, somebody. We don't want to tell the story that we was one of those lifelong college students. Amen. One of my one of my one of my uh, 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 friends, uh, Aunt Chief, seventy something years old from Texas. So she's one of those you know uh, wonderful fussy grandmothers. You know, just always said the first thing that came to your mind. Didn't care if it fell the wrong way. Just was like you just had to deal with it. And I remember I was uh, just transferred from UC Davis because I flunked out of UC Davis because I was up there playing too many video games and not going to class. So I went to a Bible college and then I went to Duke. So I was like 28 years old and I came home and she said, Michael, what's wrong with you? You scared to grow up? The frustration. It's, it's some of those parts I, you know, don't always tell. I mean, I tell it now because I gotta preach, you know. So it's just good practice to just let it all out, amen. <laughs> but you know, it's an important truth, right? That your story could be the breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel, the breadcrumbs that lead people out of their dark places into the light. But you can't be so hung up on trying to hide or, or edit your story so it comes across in a way that will still have you looking like you've been the bomb your whole life. You must be able to share your story. But if truth be told, many of us as followers, just we're, we're nervous about sharing our story, especially in this Bay Area. Because folk are so anti, they're not anti-religion necessarily, they're anti-Christ, anti-the church. And none of us want to be talking about Jesus because folk be like, oh, why are you talking about Jesus? I'm feeling oppressed. <laughs> you say Jesus, I'm oppressed. Oh. But you can say anything else, Buddha, Allah, oh, that's just, oh, I admire <laughs> your spirit. I, but Jesus, you know, how many of you ever had that experience, right? Like, no, when you say Jesus, it's just like, oh, from everywhere. It's just... <laughs> but you and I have to be skilled at sharing our story. Look at what happens here in this passage. Uh, we see uh, in verse number, I think I have it up there, 48, when the Gentiles heard the story of Jesus. These are the ways they responded. They were glad. 
It, they praised God and they became believers. So, be clear now. You know, I know many of us feel like we're, we're being uh, persecuted for our stories. But again, I love Hebrews chapter 12 because it gives us a little bit of help where it says, you have not resisted to the point of blood yet. Amen? I mean, I know we in a, a culture where folks ain't all excited about Jesus, but no one's asking you to shed no blood. So let's keep it in context. Back then, folk was dying for just mentioning Jesus. Here they just kind of scoff at you. You know, won't eat lunch with you. Won't invite you over for some milk and cookies. Amen. <laughs> so, but even during that time, they figured out a way to tell this story in a way, listen, where people heard it. So you got to learn how to share your story in a way where people can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? This is why I love the translation. That's why all of us have came to Jesus in a different way. I came to Jesus through the loins of my parents. Holiness of heaven. <laughs> and my dad had his belt all along the way to make sure that I remember that hell was real. I'm just kidding. Amen. Some of us came through the atheist agnostic track. Some of us came through the, you know, uh, 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 other religious track. Some of us just walked into church after a trauma happened in your life and, and fell in a relationship with Jesus. Amen. So it ain't like, you know, it's going to be one way the, all the time, but you got to be able to Share the way, the story of the light of the gospel shine in your life. Some go sing the hymns. I have decided. That's not a hymn. What's a hymn? <laughs> uh, amazing grace. How, and then some, some of us go, go, go through the hip hop. You know? Hip hop skippity bop. this story. Because you know what? It is not the form that transmits the light. It is the essence. Don't get caught in the form where you minimize the essence, the truth, the content of the gospel. I believe when people hear the good news, not your bad You hear good news. If folk ain't happy after you talking to them about your story of this gospel, I want to submit you are telling them bad news. You need to just go back in your prayer closet, a couple live groups, listen a few more sermons, figure out how to share the good news. Because the good news makes people glad. The good news can be heard by everybody. The good news can catalyze belief and curiosity in what God is doing. Hello, somebody. So how do you share your story? Scripture says that I will tell of the goodness of the Lord while I'm in the land of the living. That means every day you are alive, you ought to be sharing your story. Second thing that I, I want to lift up, how to let your light shine and light it up. Invite people to church. All right? Everybody say invite somebody to church. Invite somebody to church. <laughs> Why should I invite people to church? Well, it's good to be in a place where you can be in community. To hear the good news. Verse number 44, the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. It's important.
important, I think, for you to start practicing being more invitational to people to come hang out with you in places and spaces where God is worshipped, the word is proclaimed, the community is encouraging one another. Now church, Sunday mornings is, you know, one of our big gatherings, but you also have opportunities to meet throughout the week. So church ain't just about showing up 1305 University Avenue, although I would love and want us to be bringing and gathering more folk together, because I want us to see diversity of believers, young, old, racial diversity, uh, gender diversity, all the kind of, I want people to be able to look around and be like, wow, this, this gospel, this good news is for everybody. Because many of us only hang out with people who look like us, eat what we eat, like what we like, do what we do. We can kind of become very myopic. And think that this only works for people who are like me. Exactly carbon copy like me. But how many of you know that the gospel ain't just about what you like? Amen. Hello, somebody. So, gathering a whole city together to hear the word of the Lord, you're going to always get some difference in the room. And when we can learn to live in difference, live in community despite our difference, I think it creates opportunity for the light to shine brighter. So you should invite people to church, into your Christian community. You should not go months without inviting someone to come hang out with you in your Christian community. Don't they invite you to come do stuff with you? No? Nobody invites y'all ever? I mean, y'all some sad, lonely folk. Amen. Maybe we need to do a sermon on how to be cool enough to be invited to go somewhere. How, about that? how many got invited to watch Cal beat them uh, Arizona Wildcats? Any, any sports activities? Yes, I see ladies are clearing them in the house. Thank God for her. Amen. How many of y'all have been invited to a party before? Yes, good. How many of y'all ever been invited, uh, I don't know, to a dinner before? Amen. Anybody? Amen. So, so you, you get invited all the time. What's so hard about saying, why would you come hang out with me on a Sunday? on a Tuesday night during our small group. I promise we're gonna be there for 90 minutes. It ain't one of those all day church, you know, hijackings, amen, where you come in when the sun is coming up and you leave when the sun is going down. <laughs> why, why do I think you should invite folks to the way? Because I think you will always hear the word of God proclaimed there. I think you will always feel the power of inspirational and anointed music and worship. I think you will always be embraced and welcomed and loved. I think you'll find some folk that you would not could connect or hook up with anywhere else. So I think this is a pretty safe place to invite folk to. And you ain't got to ask them for their first child. When they come, your down payment is the most important thing in your life. But it's just real light. Keep it light. Just come hang out with me. And you got, I'm giving, Easter's coming up. Last Sunday in March. So you got two months. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And I know someone's got to get our courage. So act like you got an imaginary courage pump on your right foot. And just start doing like that. <laughs> pump up your courage pump. To just form your lips. To invite somebody into Christian. I mean, that's how you light it up. You allow them to see that there are places where people are celebrating the light of God, even in the midst of difference. That's an important reality in this moment. Hello, somebody. Because the world is breaking and fragmenting apart along the lines of all kinds of social created categories. <clears throat> that God didn't create that stuff, we created that stuff. God said, I'm gonna create you in the image of God, in my image, that's it, boom. And you're gonna have my thumbprint, boom. That's all God sees when he sees us. He don't see my hair, he don't see my weight, he don't see my color, he don't see my nation of origin. He looks at me and sees, wow, yep, that's, that's me inside of them, that's my image. And I want us to be comfortable 
And fighting that image of God in every person into the house of God. Hello, somebody. Is that good? Is that good? Invite someone to church. And remember that this invitation ends of the earth. What is your end of the earth? So who are those folks you're most familiar with? I know some folks, we, I was in San Francisco yesterday, and they were, you know, uh, uh, we were up, up in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a boardroom having a meeting with some of my friends from Ferguson. We was here doing some work, and outside there was one of those street preachers with his uh, big sign, the end of the world is coming, and, and hell is real, and he just was hollering and screaming, and, you know, I, I remember we were in, in Philadelphia for the Pope event and there was a whole chorus of people out there who just were out there in the public just convinced about all kinds of messages. And I was thinking to myself, that is one strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but there may be a, another strategy where you start with the people in your circle. How many know somebody that could use some light? I mean, what would keep you from inviting them to a place where you know light will always be shining? Just a, just a, just a, it's a challenge, just a challenge. So I got this question up here. Who are the people you can invite to your church in your family, on your job, or in your community? Is there anybody that you can think of? Anybody you can think of that could be open to this invitation? And again, there are moments and times we're going to have a Super Bowl party in a couple weeks. That's a good Sunday to invite somebody. Tell them, I know you got a little 19-inch TV at your house and you're probably just going to watch it by yourself. You can come watch it on two big screens <laughs> with a lot of people, food, games. Who would say no to that? Maybe the recluse, I don't know, somebody who just want to be by himself. But you know, even though none of our teams, sorry Phil, are uh, in the Super Bowl this year. Sorry Jake, okay, man, we all just move for somebody else. It's still a good opportunity to invite somebody to church. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, give an invitation, give an invitation. And then the last thing we'll talk about, how do you light it up? Go big. I like this. This verse in Acts 13, 47, where it says that we are uh, being set up as a light to the Gentiles, actually comes from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 49 and 7. Put that scripture up where it says this. Isaiah is, is, is kind of collecting the words of the Lord uh, to the people that are there coming out of exile. And they're trying to figure out what is our mission. We've just been in exile. We've been away from the land of our ancestors, the promised land. And now we're trying to figure out what is the mission of God for our lives. Isaiah 49, 6, it says, What an honor for me in God's eyes that God should be my strength. But God says to them, listen, that's not a big enough job for my servant. To just gather and recover the tribes of Jacob, merely to round up the strays of Israel, I'm setting you up as a light for the nations. So my salvation can be global. Now that's a big job, right? I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that some of what we're being asked to do, if we're going to light it up, is we got to think big about the possibilities of what God would want to do in and through us. I know we have in our minds, because of life, we've been used to diminishing our expectations. Resources 
sins. But I hear God saying, I want to do something so big in you that it would be clear to everyone that it had to be God. And there's, there's good theological foundation for this in the Reformed Church. Uh, you find these theological uh, understandings of how God wanted in the life of Israel to do work in two kinds of ways. The first way was called centripetal effect where God would do such amazing work inside of the country of Israel that people all around the Israel culture would be clear that God was real by what God was doing inside the nation. But then there was a centrifugal force where God wanted to be so good to Israel where all of those outside of Israel would be able to look at what God was doing to Israel and be drawn And I want to say to you that God is trying to do such good things in your life because he wants you to have such a big shining in the world that people will be clear that that had to be God working in your life. That your education was not strong enough for you to end up in that place. That your talent was not so skilled for you to end up in that place. That your money was not so, so robust that you could end up in that place were not so high place that you can end up in this place. But God wants to do something in your life where you will have to step back and say, after all I've done, people will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was God going big in my life. And can you think of a few places where God is going big in your life, where God right now is starting to pull your mind, he's starting to open up doors and he's starting to position you in places where you always wanted to be or you see that God is working and reordering some things in your life you, you thought you were going to be defined by this worst mistake you've ever made but God is finding a way to erase that out of your memory and out of the memories of others you thought that you would only be limited because of your education but God has opened up a door for your education to not be the final determining factor for where you will be and what you will do. God is opening up a dream for you to be able to accomplish that thing you dreamed about when you were a child and you know that this has to be nobody but God. Your children were far away and you never thought that they'll be back in the place where God can speak to them but you're starting to see that God is turning it around and around. Even in your own life, you were far from God and you were away from God but God Circumstances may come up. But what will I do? What should I do? I love this Howard Thurman quote. It says, Don't ask yourself what the world needs, but ask yourself what makes you come alive. And then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. When the light of God's gospel shines inside of you, God can work through whatever he is animating inside of you. God don't need everybody to be a preacher. He don't need everybody to be a singer. He don't need everybody to be a politician. He don't need everybody to be a teacher. He don't need everybody to be a, 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 a waste management person. He don't need everybody to be a, a, a whatever you are. God needs you to be wherever God has placed you. And in the middle of where you're placed, God will animate a fire inside of you. As that fire burns, you'll be alive. And as you are alive, I believe God will draw people to the light of this gospel. Light it up by sharing your story. Light it up by inviting people into your Christian space. Light it up by going big. The big question then is, what are the glaring needs that are around you? 
And how can you go big for God where God has placed you? Oh, think about it. Don't just minimize the possibility of you being the light to the nations. But go big. God, I, I always like to have a, a two kind of simultaneous things happening in my work and walk with God. I want to do something, God, that I know is uniquely fashioned through my giftings. Then I'd be a good steward over that. But I also want to have something, God, that is just so beyond me that I know if, if this happens, <laughs> this has got to be God.